Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club number 14. Uh, we're lucky to be joined today by our curator of ornithology and mammalogy, also known as birds and mammals, Dr. Jack Dumbacher. Hi, Jack. Hi there, how you doing? Pretty good. Your um, backyard is making everyone with a nature-themed Zoom background really jealous. It's fun to be here, and because I'm an ornithologist, of course, I have my bird book <laughs> handy and my binoculars handy in my office, so it's not a bad time to be working from home. Yeah, I'm jealous too. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna start this by taking a stab at highlighting just a few of the research areas people may have heard your name uh, connected to in news stories or other academy stuff. So first, chemical defenses in birds, most notably the poisonous birds of Papua New Guinea. Second, sengies, also known as elephant shrews, which everybody should just immediately stop and Google because in addition to being interesting from an evolutionary perspective, they're ridiculously cute. And Jack, I think you actually described like the cutest sengi known to science. So good job there, <laughs> <laughs> the round eared. Um, barred and spotted owls, which we'll, you'll talk more about today and get pretty in depth on. Uh, all kinds of phylogenetic and biogeography work, which is harder to sum up, but basically seeks to answer questions about evolution. And then when you're not busy, you teach master birding classes sometimes. So that seems like, you know, well done. Great job being an A plus scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the um, question that I want to ask before I hand this over is just how did you get here? Like, where did you grow up and how did you fall in love with these two gargantuan areas of study? Oh, gosh. Um... I grew up in the Midwest, and um, and I I started traveling just road trips as a you know as an undergraduate student, and that's kind of where I started to fall in love with birds and natural history and wild places, and um, and I started taking classes with professors. And, you know, I was a pre med major because I thought if you were into biology, that's what you did. You went into yeah. medicine, and um, and I had a couple professors who did work in in Baja California, and I went down there and I was like, this is amazing. You guys get paid to do this. It's what I want to do, and um, and I've just been really fortunate. I've been able to do it the rest of my life so far. So, yeah. And was it always was it always birds? And then your interest in or your the work in mammals kind of grew out of that initial. Um, I actually started with an interest in marine mammals, and huh. I and I went to Australia on a, a dime and had no money and volunteered on different um, in different field sites to do work. And I was really more interested in marine mammals, but I fell in love with the reef and um, in fish. But then I got a cut on my hand and I wasn't able to dive for a couple of weeks. And I, that was when I realized, gosh, it's so much work putting on the, all that dive equipment. You only get a couple of hours underwater. And like you can sit on land and watch birds all day long. And they're so interesting. They have so many amazing behaviors. And um, I said, birds is really the way to go. And um, so that's kind of how I got into birds, but I still love marine environments and fish. And I still love marine mammals, which we do a lot of in our department, but mostly yeah. our collection manager, Mo Flannery leads a lot of that work. Yeah. And you're, I, are you going to talk a little bit about collections in the, in your talk or should I just mention them? Now? Very briefly, I'll, okay. I'll hint about the collections and, and, and the project I'll be talking about today is, is, um, is really aided by the collection. So being able okay. to use collections is, is key to what we do at the Academy. Okay, well, I'll let you get started. Thank you so much again for being here. Um, thank you to everyone who's watching. And a reminder that if you are watching live, you can ask questions anytime just by leaving them in comments. And we'll circle back at the end of Jack's talk to ask as many as we can. So with that, uh, Dr. Jack Dumbacher and the Deep Forest Owls of the Pacific Northwest. Thanks, Jack. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. It's great to be here. Thanks everybody for coming. I hope you've got your coffee handy because um, we're gonna be chatting for a little while here. Um, and as Laurel noted, um, I'm curator of birds and mammals. We have a lot of different research and she talked about some of that, but we study the evolution of birds, the ecology of birds. Um, we've worked in Galapagos. We've worked on diseases of birds and conservation issues. We've worked in Namibia. Um, one of my favorite projects, with, which Laurel already mentioned, is poisonous birds of New Guinea. Hopefully I'll come back and give a whole talk on that at some point. But that's taken us to some beautiful parts of the world, including like the most remote jungles in New Guinea and the high Himalaya on the China-Burma border, um, the deserts of Namibia, and some fascinating places in the U.S. too. Um, we do work in the Sierra Nevada. We've done work um, studying small mammals in, um, in the sheep range in, in the deserts of Nevada. Um, and um, and we're doing work in the Pacific Northwest on the forest owls, which I'm going to be talking about. One of the things that 
is so great about working at the Academy is the scientific collections and all museums have at our heart um, some sort of collections. And for us, that's the scientific collections. Our bird collections have over 100,000 bird specimens in them and that they and they span back over 150 years. And so it's a lot of history and it's a lot of breadth and depth in those collections. And they allow us to do work that we could never do um, if we didn't have access to all those materials. And so um, in keeping with the collections and also with our stay at home orders, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about something closer to home um, and, and the, I, which something that I think is really thought provoking and that's the deep forest owls of the Pacific Northwest. And so let's get started on that topic and, uh, and I'll introduce you first to the Northern Spotted Owl, um, Strix occidentalis. And, uh, and this is a beautiful big forest owl um, it, uh, it's chocolate brown with spotting on the heads. The male is a little bit smaller than the female, which is true for most raptors. Uh, you know, they sort of divide the, their, their habitat um, and their prey base by hunting different sized animals. Um, they're mostly restricted to areas with large, thick forests and mostly old growth stands. And that's really important because those old growth stands have been declining in recent years or over the last hundred years due to logging, human encroachment, development, things like that. And they tend to roost in the cool, shady spots near the streams on the lower third of the slopes. They're usually recognized by their call. They have a beautiful four note call, which sort of, sort of goes like this. It goes, ooh, 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 ooh. And so that's how you will often encounter them because they're very hard to see at night. Now, there are three different subspecies of uh, spotted owls that are named. The northern spotted owl is found from British Columbia and down the coast uh, in all the way down to Marin. The California spotted owl picks up around the Pitt River up by Mount Lassen and is found on the spine of the Sierras all the way down to the southern California area and then up the coast all the way to Monterey Bay. There's a third species, the Mexican spotted owl, which is found in the Sky Islands of the desert southwest and down into Mexico. Um, their ecology, they mostly forage at night and they're sit and wait predators. If you've ever spent much time in the, in the redwood forests around here, you know that it's very, very quiet at night and you can hear every little rustling in the ground or in the leaf litter or up on the bark of a tree. And so the um, northern spotted owls, what they do is they'll sit, wait, listen, and when they hear a little bit of rustling, they'll fly out. Most of what they eat over 90% of what they eat is small rodents, small mammals. And most of that is dusky-footed wood rats towards the south. And as you move north, they begin to, to um, eat more and more flying squirrels to the point where in the far north, the, most of their diet is northern flying squirrels. But they can eat a lot of different things. They can feed on birds and, um, and uh, invertebrates and even things like amphibians. Um, but most of their diet is these, um, these rodents, these mammals. So you might remember that in 1990, the Northern Spotted Owl was listed as an, uh, threatened under the Endangered Species Act, primarily due to population declines and destruction of their critical habitat. And they were kind of held up by a lot of the conservation organizations as a sort of flagship species for old growth forests to try and preserve some of those old growth environments in the Western US. So when they listed them, um, one of the things that they did was they tried to estimate, you know, what's the trajectory? How fast are they in decline? And, um, and so one of the key parameters that they measured is something called annual rate of population change or lambda. And it, if lambda is one, that means that the population is stable. So you're basically multiplying this population today by one and getting the size of next population. Um, and then if the, if the lambda is anything below one, then you multiply it and you see that the population is shrinking. And if it's above one, it increases. And the amount above one um, gets compounded like interest in your account, okay? But anything below is like eating into the principal on your account. So you might think that, you know, numbers like 984 isn't very bad, you know, 98%, that's an A on your exam, right? But that also means that you're eating into your principal at 1.6% per year. Again, it doesn't seem that big, but if you actually plot out what these populations would look like, so the best performing populations had a lambda around 0.984. And so over 30 years, and 30 years is a good bench line because the species was listed 30 years ago, we should be down to about 60% of the population that we had when they were first listed. 
okay? But remember, that's the best population. Some of the worst performing populations had a lambda around 0.828, and they should be effectively extinct by now if everything was business as usual. And on average, okay, across the, across the entire range of northern spotted owls, we would expect there to be about 30% if they continued on as they were. So it seemed like a, a really huge loss and um, a, a very big concern to wildlife biologists. So in 2004, there was what they call a, a four or a five year status review where they reviewed all the data to see how, how things were working out and, and you know, kind of to take the pulse of the northern spotted owl and see how they were doing. Well, in fact, if we look at that main parameter, that lambda again for the eight Northwest forest plan areas, the average was 0.976, so not all that good. And you can see again, like that's a huge decline over, you know, over a number of years. And if we actually estimate um, starting around 1992 um, and go down to where we are today, those Northwest Forest Service plan areas should be under 50% of what, what they started with during the listing. And remember, those are the ones with the highest and best protection. But the average area that's not under the Northwest Forest Plan would have an average lambda that's much lower. And we should be down to about 20% of the population that we started with. And so that wasn't a very good checkup that they went through in 2004. And people were very concerned still about the Northern Spotted Owl. And at that time, they also had some other data suggesting that there's this other owl called the Barred Owl, and that it may be an important factor. So they showed that Barred owls were increasing um, in the in the northwest forest um, areas, and that the, the populations were beginning to skyrocket. So prior to 1974, they were there, but in really really low numbers. But something happened, and those populations began to to rise. In addition to that, there was also information suggesting that as the barred owls were coming in and sort of taking off, the spotted owls were declining. And we were seeing data like where they had the data, we were seeing that similar patterns in the north and in the south, but the timing was different. And so, um, so it looked like there was a strong correlation between barred owls and spotted owls. But remember that correlation doesn't mean causation. So we don't know what's causing what. It could be that barred owls are moving in and causing the decline of the spotted owl. And that's very concerning. But the other possibility is, is that spotted owls are going extinct on their own for some other reason, and barred owls were just filling in the empty spaces. That might actually be a good thing. So it was really important for biologists to figure out what was going on. So this is when I got involved. So um, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about who are these barred owls. Um, so this is a picture of a barred owl. Uh, they're also in the same genus. Uh, they're genus and species is Strix varia. So they're pretty close relatives of the western, um, of the northern spotted owl. Uh, they're large chocolate brown woodland owls. They're ecologically very similar to northern spotted owls. Uh, they're a little bit more aggressive, at least in the east, than northern spotted owls. And they pref prefer the same types of forests. They, so they prefer mature old growth forests, typically mixed deciduous conifer forests. Um, but they were primarily an owl of the eastern United States. So if we look at this range map, you see this is the traditional or the historical range um, of the barred owl as we understand it. And then around 1900, maybe a little bit around 1900, they started to move and we, were, we, got, we got records of them in the boreal forests of Canada um, and they made it to... Uh, they made it this far around 1934. Around 1943, they actually began to hit the range of the northern spotted owl. By 1965, they made it to the coast in Washington and British Columbia. By 74, they made it all the way to the Oregon border. By 81, they made it to the California border. And in 2003, they've made it all the way down to Marin County. So you can see that they're pretty rapidly um, moving westward and southward. If we look at a map um, of data from basically now, um, this is eBird data, and you can see now um, where they have expanded to. And there are records of them all the way down the Sierra Nevada, all the way down as far as San Bernardino County, so in Bakersfield. So, um, so they're they're moving, and now they overlap 
almost 100% um, with Northern Spotted Owl and California Spotted Owl. So how did they get here? This is a really important question and, and folks are interested in this. Um, partly to understand like, did is this something we caused or is this something that just is natural and unfolding? Um, so uh, again, here's the here's the range. And if, if we look at data, uh, this is um, this is the Hans North America data set, and because these are forest owls, they're going to be restricted habitats, um, and so you can see that you know this would have been their their historical range, um, and so one possibility is is that and, and of course remember that the Great Plains don't have many trees, so this would have been a, a very difficult for them to leapfrog over. Um, this would have been a big barrier for their dispersal, but perhaps as climate changed. And as the earth warmed, it allowed the barred owls to move northward and catch some of these southern forests of Canada, and it allowed them to move westward. And so that was one hypothesis that maybe climate change allowed them to expand their range and then invade the western United States. Another possibility, though, um, that Kent Livesey wrote about in a paper nearly a decade ago now, is that, that humans, especially westerners, um, did a lot to change the environment in the Great Plains states. And so if you actually look at museum records and other types of records, there are some accounts of uh, barred owls moving across the Midwest and through this corridor. And some of these are quite old records. This one's from 1873. So one possibility is that they move this way, but another possibility is that they move through the Great Plains states where we've altered habitat, planted trees, um, and you know, tried to manage the dust bowl, if you will. Um, and created habitat for barred owls in those areas. So, you know, there's a couple of different potential ways, um, but one is because of climate change, the other one is because of human altered habitats in the Midwest. But either way, um, the, the route was likely made possible by human changes to the environment. So in 2005, a bunch of biologists got together to try and figure out, well, how do we actually figure out you know, are barred owls causing the decline of spotted owls or are they just filling in those empty spaces? And there's two different kinds of studies that people had proposed. Some were ecological studies, which colleagues um, colleagues began to do at that time. They were trying to figure out, well, you know, how fast do they reproduce? What kinds of habitat do they use? Um, looking at their diet, things like that. Um, another group of people realized that really the gold standard in these kinds of studies would be to, if you could remove barred owls from some of these areas, then you can see how the spotted owls respond. And you can actually see, you know, how much the barred owl is affecting spotted owl. So a group of biologists began to plan these studies. And because I'm in a museum, I said, well, hey, you guys, if these studies are going to be done, let's make sure that all these specimens end up in the museum so that none of them go to waste and so that we can document the movement of spotted or movement of barred owls, if you will, into the Western United States and, 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 um, and do some things with those specimens. And so the goal of those initial experiments were to document barred owls in the United States and test whether barred owls um, actually affect spotted owls and how spotted owls respond to the removals. But even then people were beginning to think about, well, what if we actually, if, if, barred owls are causing the demise of spotted owls, is it even possible for us to manage barred owls? And so that was one of the things that they wanted to ask too. And so, so folks started doing these removal experiments um, and what they did was they would use a caller, a speaker out in the forest to put it out there that would call the owls in. They'd use a shotgun to actually shoot, kind of like hunting, except for this is not sporting. They just wanna remove the owl as quickly and cleanly as possible. Um, and then we would step in and we would get all the specimens that we could We'd get field measurements, data, information about the effort, full tissues for studies of DNA and RNA, environmental contaminants, disease, all kinds of things that I'll talk a little bit more about. And then the carcass is frozen. Now what we would do is bring these carcasses back or when they were sent to us, we would take them in the museum. Then we could prepare them as typical museum skins. This is what a typical museum skin looks like. So it's it's all the feathers and the beak and the legs, and they're stuffed with cotton so that scientists can see the outsides of them and study the feathers and the plumage. Um, but we also take full tissues for DNA and RNA. Uh, all the material that's removed from the body is, is placed in jars and pickled in either ethanol or in formalin for scientists to study. 
um, and all of the the diet information is is recovered as well. So we have all that material in the museum collection. Um, so one of the questions is, and that our colleagues were all studying was, how do spotted owls recover after the removal of barred owls? So some of these studies were done and they collected all this data. This is looking at occupancy levels. So you can see that over time, the occupancy, which is the, the portion of the habitat that's occupied by spotted owls, has been declining in, in part probably. Um, but you can see that when barred owls began to be removed in 2009, there was a, a quick um, change in behavior in spotted owls. And spotted owls in those removal areas began to actually go up. So occupancy is increasing here in areas where barred owls are removed. But in the controlled areas where barred owls were continuing to increase, we could see a continued decrease in spotted owls. So this was really the first evidence, the first really clear evidence that barred owls were impacting and driving at spotted owls. So um, they also used all this data in a, in a larger range-wide demographic study. So they had data from spots in Washington and Oregon and in Northern California where these first removals were being done. And the only area where lambda was greater than one, that is that the populations of spotted owls were healthy or growing. The only area where they were growing is where barred owls were removed here on that green diamond timber area in Northern California. Every other area, um, spotted owls continue to be in decline. So that showed that and we also learned that the removal of barred owls was actually not that difficult. It wasn't that hard to call the owls in. It didn't cost that much money. It didn't take that much time. And one thing that we have been able to, to learn from our own history as humans is that it's not that hard to wipe out top predators. And so for better or for worse, US Fish and Wildlife Service and other folks are considering the possibility of using lethal removal as a management tool to help save northern spotted owls. So we'll get back to that topic a little bit later. Um, we did find that spotted owls responded favorably, which really showed quite clearly that barred owls were one of the leading factors um, affecting uh, spotted owl declines. Um, so what I wanna talk a little bit about is what we at the museum have been able to do with all these specimens that have been coming in. And since those first removal studies, now we've got over 250 barred owls in the collection that have been removed by different removal studies from Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and now even some um, from the Sierra Nevada. So, um, and these have been incredibly valuable specimens. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've been able to learn because we have these specimens. So first of all, a really cool and interesting thing that you can do, um, when birds first molt their feathers, they have these pigments in them that are called porphyrins. And when you shine a black light or a fluorescent light on them, the porphyrin pigments glow pink. And interestingly, in normal daylight, uh, those pigments break down under UV light. And so they're usually faded in most birds. Um, but in owls, because they're only active at night, you can actually shine a light on the underside of the wing of an owl and the newer feathers glow pink. And you can see here how that pink begins to fade over time so that the oldest feathers don't glow anymore. So you can see that this bird has recently molted um, some of the, uh, the contour feathers uh, and coverts and underwing and some of these uh, primaries and secondaries that you see glowing pink. And this has allowed us to identify new feathers and old feathers and figure out when molts happen and also to be able to identify young from adults. And we're also using this to, to help see if we can figure out how to identify males from females. So having all these specimens in the collection is allowing us to go out to the field and take pictures of owls and look closely at their feathers and determine their age and potentially their sex. And so this has been a, a really huge and very valuable use of the collections. Um, we've also done disease studies, diet studies, um, some of these others I'll get to one by one. So one possibility that people have been interested in is, is whether or not barred owls may be carrying a pathogen um, or, you know, in, in the same way that some populations of humans are, are more susceptible to some diseases that might be brought in from outside. This is something that kind of rings true, right? We should all be, we're all kind of aware of how that can happen. Um, 
And so one of the one of the possibilities is that barred owls may be carrying some parasites. So what we did was we looked at blood parasites from all the owls that came in, and we looked at um, malaria type parasites. So those are Plasmodium, Hemoproteus, um, and Leucocytozoans, and we're able to sequence those those parasites genomes and look at their relationships. And we've been able to look at the blood parasites in barred owls and spotted owls, and look at some of the conservation implications. And it was interesting because. Uh, in, in that work, spotted owls did seem to have a very high incidence um, of some of those parasites, but it was a little bit hard for us to understand they've been brought over um, by the barred owls, at least with the sampling that we had, but that's an ongoing research. We've also found that as we skin out and prepare these owls, that there's lots of other really interesting parasites uh, that the barred owls are carrying. This is one that I show here, this little thing, it's a worm that actually crawls out of the eyes of the barred owls when we begin to work with them. And in fact, from one area that we've done work, nearly 100% of the barred owls are carrying these worms in their eye and throughout other parts of their body. So we're working with parasitologists from University of Georgia who've helped identify these, but we're also trying to figure out what the fitness effects, what the implications of having these parasites might be for the health of barred owls and also um, you know, we're hoping that we can um, work with colleagues to survey them in spotted owls. And we've also taken samples for virus work. Um, and we've got DNA uh, samples uh, that we can search through for viruses as well. And that's something that we hope to do in the near future. Um, I mentioned that all the birds that come in, we've been able to remove their stomachs and we've been able to look at all the different things that they, that they have in their stomach. So we just get one meal per bird, but it's been very interesting because Previous studies have worked with pellets that owls regurgitate, and only certain types of things are recovered in the regurgitated pellets. Um, and we've been able to really broaden the, the, our understanding of owl diets by looking at these stomach contents. So I'm just gonna run you through a, a few different slides, but um, this includes uh, over 159 owls from the Hoopa tribal lands and about 80 owls from from coastal um, lands up in Northern California. And when we look through all of the different diets or all the different stomach contents, we found that about 51% of the barred owl's diet is mammal. Um, again, you know that some of their favorite things include Northern flying squirrels and dusky footed wood rats. So those are the things that, um, that we also see spotted owls eating, but they also take a lot of shrew moles, um, a lot of shrews, um, things as big as Douglas squirrels um, and even um, some hares and, and rabbits, things like that. So, so very interesting. So they still take mostly small mammals, but, um, but a, a much lower percentage and a much broader diet than the northern spotted owls. So if we look at birds in the diet, um, barred owls also eat a lot of birds. So nearly a quarter of their diet um, is composed of birds and all kinds of things you see in those forests, but also they include western screech owl and northern pygmy owl. So they're slightly bigger than northern spotted owls and they can be begin to eat some of the other smaller owls, things that you know probably northern spotted owls won't eat. And so that may be having an, an impact on some of the other birds in the forest as well. They also take about 17 or 18 percent of their diet in amphibians. Um, eating some really interesting things like Encetina, which is one of our common forest salamanders, um, but also coast giant salamander. Um, and interestingly, the rough skin newt. Now, if you or I was to eat a rough skin newt, we would probably die because they're poisonous and they carry a, a toxin known as tetrodotoxin. So it's interesting that these owls were able to eat um, these rough skin newts. And we even published a little paper just on that. Um, they also take a number of reptiles, including alligator, lizards, and a variety of snakes. Um, but interestingly, and even though this by biomass is a small uh, proportion of the diet, it's a huge number of individual diet items, all kinds of invertebrates from katydids, which was one of the biggest things, to grasshoppers, Jerusalem crickets, forest scorpions, land snails, centipedes, caterpillars. We even have pictures of them. Um, actually pulling night crawlers up out of the ground um, with, so, you know, they eat all kinds of different things. And most of these would not be recorded in the pellets that the owls regurgitate. So, um, so it's really been valuable to have these stomach contents. 
then if we summarize all that data and we compare um, what the what the barred owl eats compared to spotted owls, and remember again, the spotted owls are 95% mammals um, and just 3% birds and a couple of you know percent all the other things combined. Barred owls are taking 51% mammals, and there's still a huge amount of overlap between what barred owls and spotted owls eat. And it appears that they still prefer um, these mammals, but that they can survive on other things in substandard habitat and in places where um, where spotted owls can't. And so that seems to be part of the key to this. Um, so in, in addition, um, after we began taking all these owls and putting them in the collection, we were contacted by a guy named Murad Gabriel, who's been studying exposure to rodenticides and other environmental toxins in, in different forests. And having these owls gave us a really unique opportunity to look at what a top predator is exposed to. It takes a big part of the liver um, to do these analyses. And so, you know, it's something that you can never do on live birds. And in the past, has only been done on a small number of birds and mostly things that get brought into wildlife hospitals. And those are already, you know, sort of suspect. They might have, you know, might be sick from some other um, thing. And so it's always hard to interpret those data. But because the barred owls have been collected from their natural habitat in the wild and they're all healthy owls, um, this was a really amazing proxy um, for what top predators are exposed to in the environment. And so we were able to do these really cool um, studies with the, using the livers of these barred owls to see how many of them were actually exposed to environmental contaminants. So we were able to, to, to take about 80 of those um, and then survey them for, for toxicity. And we found that 34 or about 40% of them had measurable levels of rodenticide accumulated in their bodies from exposure in the wild. And at first we were like, wow, that's that's higher than anyone you know, might have expected. That was a pretty high percentage of animals. And we thought, well, maybe these are just the ones that live closer to people or you know, closer to human habitation. And it turned out that that wasn't true, that most of the ones that had the highest toxicity were actually out in the wild, far away from roads or far away from where, where people um, normally are where there's businesses. And it turns out that if you look at satellite images, in almost every case, we were able to identify an illegal trespass marijuana grove that was planted out there in the forest. Um, and and what they typically do, and there's a lot more information about this now, but I think it's a really underappreciated thing, um, that in these Northwest forests of California and in Oregon and Washington, um, people will go out and they'll plant a little patch of marijuana illegally on somebody else's land or on government land, and they'll clear it and they'll just blanket it with all kinds of pesticides and herbicides and um, and things to get the grow to grow as quickly as possible. And then they just pack everything up, um, pack up all the plants and haul it out, but they leave all of that trash out there. And that trash has incredible environmental impacts that we're only now beginning to wrap our minds around. And rodenticide is one of the ways that we can detect that because it gets accumulated in the food chain, it gets washed into rivers, um, but we can pick it up even in top predators um, where it gets accumulated and passed up. And so it turns out that this is a huge, huge important issue. And you would think that as cannabis becomes legalized, that this would all go away. But in fact, it's been just the opposite. And these, these black market grows are even more important. And as the demand for cannabis has grown and spread across the country, there's even more pressure on these forests to produce the cannabis for these markets. And a lot of it is still produced illegally. And so it's a huge issue. And uh, other owl biologists have published more papers on this. This one, grass is not always greener. And it talks about rodenticide exposure near marijuana growing operations. And another paper that just came out a couple months ago um, from another group of owl biologists. And they looked and, and found that nearly 50% of the owls that they've been removing from lands in Oregon and Washington um, tested positive for, for uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. So this is a huge issue that we're really only able to highlight and track using some of these barred owl specimens that have come into the museums. Now, I'm actually a geneticist by training, so all those other things are super fun and 
um, and great information about the ecology and the biology of owls. But I've been really interested in the genetics of the barred owls. And as we're re receiving these specimens, I'm often scratching my head and looking at them because these Western barred owls shown here in the middle look very different in many cases from their Eastern barred owls, from the ancestral population that they presumably came from. And just for comparison, this is what a Northern spotted owl specimen looks like. So you can see here the difference between the spotty breast and the, the different color um, of the, the more dark um, plumage of the uh, northern spotted owl versus the eastern barred owl. But the western barred owl looks so different and we were really interested in what's going on by the big difference. So there are three different hypotheses that might be able to explain why uh, the western barred owl looks is generally smaller, generally darker, and generally less stripy and more spotty than its eastern counterpart. And one of them is that they may be hybridizing they may be hybridizing with spotted owls. So as the barred owls get out here, if they're interbreeding with spotted owls, they may be picking up spotted owl genes, which causes them to look more like spotted owls. And that was what we first believed. And many of the biologists, having looked at these specimens, thought, oh, these look like hybrids. And so that was our first hypothesis that we wanted to explore. Another possibility, however, is that as they moved westward, they went through a population bottleneck. So the populations got small enough that, that drift that just random chance, um, survival of different genes due to, to random stochastic factors can cause a change in the genotype, can cause the Western owls to look different from the Eastern owls. And so one, that's one possibility. And another possibility is that, the, is that as the Western barred owls are spending time in, um, in the Western forest, they're actually adapting to those Western forests. And maybe that means becoming darker. Maybe that means becoming smaller. And maybe that means actually becoming more spotted, like spotted owls, which would be totally intriguing. And so those are some of the things that we wanted to try and study. So in order to do this, um, we realized, first of all, that, that it would be really powerful if we had the entire genome sequenced for reference. And we started this back before this was, you know, something that everybody just did. Um, and we had a graduate student, Zach Hanna, who um, was enrolled at, um, uh, at a UC Berkeley and did a lot of the work in our lab. And he did an amazing job at putting, pulling together the, the entire genome with, an, a, with so much different technology. Um, and he was able to, to produce a very nice genome, which we've improved upon over the years. And now we have, it's really among um, one of the, the better bird genomes out there. Um, and just to give you a, a little bit of an idea, there's 1.26 billion bases. Okay, so the A's and C's and G's and T's that are used to encode all the information that's necessary uh, in the genome. Um, there's 1.26 billion bases there that are all lined up in readable. Um, and we were able to do some really interesting stuff. So we've, we've published a few papers on the genome. One, we've just looked at how owls have evolved to living at night. Um, and one of those invo in involves some differences to the, to the opsins in the backs of our eye that, that absorb light and, and respond to light and allow us to see colors. Um, but we've been able to do a lot of other interesting things too to, to look at the biology of the owls. So one of the first things that we wanted to do was, was ask whether those weirdly colored Western barred owls are actually hybrids. And so this is a map um, and each one of the dots on this map is an owl, okay? And, um, and on this axis, it's telling us what proportion of its genome is spotted owl. And for reference, we have a number of 100% barred owls from the Eastern United States here. And so everything that lines up on this point right here is 100% barred owl. Everything that lines up over here were our reference spotted owls and our 100% spotted owls. Anything in the middle turns out to be a hybrid. So all those weird looking barred owls um, from Siskiyou and Western US, they all line up here. And it turns out that they're all 100% barred out. So they're not hybrids after all. And we did have two hybrids that fell in the middle. One fell right smack dab in the middle. And that's because it's a 50-50 hybrid or a first generation. We call that an F1 hybrid because it had a spotted owl parent and a barred owl parent. And so that one's 50-50. 
Now this one is what we call an F2 hybrid because it's a back cross of a hybrid barred spotted owl with a full-blooded barred owl and they end up somewhere in this range. And so that's probably an F2. So what's interesting is, is that there are hybrids and that the two owls do hybridize, but we don't find that many hybrids out there and that most of the owls, even those weird looking ones, turn out to be um, full barred owls. So that suggests that maybe they did go through a bottleneck or maybe there's some sort of adaptation or evolution happening in the Western United States. So in order to look into this more, we, we, we improved upon the, the samples that we had and we got 51 high coverage whole genome um, from 51 different owls. And this includes 11 spotted owls, um, 25 barred owls from the Eastern or 25 barred owls total, 12 from the Eastern United States and 13 from the Western United States and a handful of different um, hybrids. And by sequencing the entire genome, we we're able to look at all those sites that vary between barred and spotted owls. And there were 17 million 385,000 of these that we call them SNPs, or, um, and that's what we looked at. And we matched up whether the SNP matched barred owl or spotted owl, and then we were able to plot each one of the owls. So again, um, each one of these dots corresponds to an owl and where it fits on this principal components axis. So it takes all that variation and kind of smashes the most of the variation in these two axes. And what we see is that these are the Eastern barred owls here. And our Western barred owls are very diverged, very different from Eastern barred owls. And that was really fascinating to us because we sort of expected that if, East, if the Western barred owls came from Eastern barred owls, that they should be clustering with the Eastern barred owls, their genetic close relatives. And there's quite a bit of distinction between the two. The other thing is, is this is where our spotted owls are. And you can see some differences between the different subspecies. Um, and then here's where our hybrids are. So we do have hybrids in the data set. So we have quite a few more hybrids. And these again are the F1s, the 50-50 hybrids um, that are probably the first generation of hybrids. But then we have a number of backcrossed individuals too. So we are finding individuals that um, are um, from a from a hybrid crossing with a barred owl. Um, and so, so that's really interesting. Now, one of the things you can do is you can look at the amount of variation that you get between these and you can date, you can use genetic tools to date how old that split is. Now, interestingly, genetically, it suggests that that split may be on the order of a thousand to 7,000. I dropped a zero here or the, no, there it is. It just fell to the next line. Um, but that's a huge difference, especially since all of the other data that we had and the information that we had on the range expansion suggested that they'd only expanded their range in the last 100 or 150 years. So that's really interesting that, that there's a bigger split and that makes us scratch our heads a little bit and we're still trying to understand um, what are the evolutionary impacts or what are the evolutionary processes that may have led to this kind of split. Um, the other thing that we can do with these genetic data is, is understand the history of these populations. So here on the x-axis, we have years or time. And here we have something about an estimate of population size or the genetically effective population size. So this is suggesting that northern spotted owls and each one of the individuals that we had is a line. And it's telling you about the ancestry of that particular individual. And it suggests that overall, that Northern spotted owls began to go through a population bottleneck from about 50,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. And that's when the glaciation um, would have been in effect in North America and probably reducing the amount of variable uh, available habitat for spotted owls in the Western United States. But then you can see that they, can, that they um, increased their populations, they rebounded after that. But Eastern barred owls don't seem to have shown um, any sort of that De decline. Um, in fact, if anything, some of those eastern barred owls actually increased their population size um, during different points. But it looks like we have samples from a couple of different eastern barred owl populations. Western barred owls, again, we thought they may have gone through some sort of a bottleneck as they came west, but there's really no evidence in that of that in the genetics. And all of the individuals that we looked at um, suggested that they didn't go through any sort of bottleneck as they came to the Western United States. So that suggests that the population must have moved and been big enough as it moved 
um, that there wasn't any loss of genetic variation as they moved across the, the United States. So that's really interesting too and has some implications um, for our work. So now if we take, take all the information from, from the folks who are doing other studies, plus the information that we've learned, now we now know that barred owls is, does appear to be a, a serious impact on spotted owls. Uh, they're larger, they're more aggressive, they're, they've been known to attack and even kill northern spotted owls. They require smaller territories. They have a more varied generalist diet. They have a more um, varied generalist habitat. They breed more regularly. They breed annually and they crank out tons more babies than spotted owls, which only breed on average every other year and only have one to two young, typically. Um, they can move greater distances when they disperse. And now throughout most of the range, um, barred owls are outnumbering spotted owls at least four to one. And so, um, so the decline of spotted owls is, is very serious and, uh, and their future is really uncertain. And another thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, barred owls um, aren't just affecting spotted owls. The places where we have data, um, so this is Western screech owl, for example, when barred owls began to move in, the Western screech owls also began to disappear. And this is data from Bainbridge Island in Washington. And a lot of this is from Christmas bird count data. So citizen science databases that people have been able to, to pull from. Um, and you know, for the most part, we really just don't even have data on many of these other species. The only reason that we have so much data on spotted owls and barred owls is because, you know, they're, because spotted owls are listed as endangered. And so there's some money and resources for them. So, I just wanted to briefly mention that after those initial studies, a much larger barred owl removal studies was began um, uh, around July 2013. And in fact, much of that was delayed due to lawsuits. And I think it's been really interesting because it's been very controversial um, removing large numbers of one species in order to try and save another species, especially when one of the species or both of the species are very large charismatic animals. And so um, I just want to summarize um, sort of that work. And it's not completed yet. They still have a couple more years to, to go, hopefully. Um, and then they'll have hopefully enough data to really try and figure out, you know, what the impacts of barred owls on spotted owls is, and also whether or not removing barred owls is a management option. So just to summarize this work, um, they've removed quite a few owls. So up in Clay Ellum in Washington, they've removed almost 500 barred owls from that area. Um, from the Oregon Coast Range, this area here, they've removed over a thousand barred owls over a five year period. And from Klamath, um, they've removed over 500. So these are huge numbers of owls that they've removed. And if we look at the impacts on spotted owls, and here are, the, here are the spotted owls in Washington. Let's start in Washington and then we'll go down the coast here and look. Now, because barred owls have been in Washington the longest period of time, there are very few spotted owls left. So we're starting with between 20 and around the order of 20 to 25 spotted owls. And you can see that since 2004, the numbers have declined to the point where now we're talking about three or four owls left in the control and treatment areas. And this is where the removals began, um, where this dotted line is. And so you can see that um, where barred owls are not removed, they continue to decline. And maybe there's an impact here. I mean, maybe spotted owls are able to come back. But in reality, up in Clay Elm, there's so few spotted owls left to come back um, that removing barred owls may not even do any good. Now, if we look at this area in the Oregon coast, um, and again, they're starting with, you know, the number of spotted owls on the order of 40 to 60 um, in 2004, but these numbers have declined tremendously um, to the point where, you know, in the in the non-removal area, that they're down to about four spotted owls left. But after removals were began, so this is this is where removals were started. It looks like spotted owls do increase a little bit, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to take some statistics to actually figure out what this impact is. But I also want to point out, remember that over a thousand barred owls have been removed from this area. And right now there's, there's only between, you know, five and 20 spotted owls left. So, you know, the number of barred owls in this area is just so vastly outnumbering spotted owls. You know, the hope for spotted owls is not that great. 
And then lastly, if we look down at Klamath, um, spotted owls seem to be doing a little bit better, but we're still only talking about, you know, 70 to 100 um, starting in 2004. And today we're down to about 30, 20 to 30 owls in each of those study areas. And again, um, removing barred owls may help a little bit, but, you know, it's going to take some statistics to really understand what that means. So um, the reason that I think that this, these studies are so interesting and important um, is partly because I think it's going to be a real watershed type of study for, for us and for us to wrap our mind around what it means to be a conservationist. Um, by law, under the Endangered Species Act, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to be required to figure out save the northern spotted owl. And in the next couple of years, we're going to see them propose to us um, probably some management of barred owls. And it's going to be really important to us to, to understand what this means. I, I, when they first started to do the, the removal studies, it was highly controversial because nobody wants to see these large, beautiful barred owls be killed, especially in the name of conservation. Um, but I think that if we're going to save the northern spotted owl, I think that measures like that are going to be necessary. So the real question is, is how do we think about you know, killing one owl to save another? So let me just point out that, first of all, we do this kind of thing all the time. Now, I'm not saying that it's the right thing to do, but it is already done. And in fact, if we look at the number of birds killed for different purposes, um, for depredation permits, so you can get a permit to kill um, brown-headed cowbirds. And in fact, the number killed between 2011 to 2013 alone is over 630,000 brown-headed cowbirds. Um, 260,000 red-winged blackbirds. Now, a lot of these depredation permits are, you know, just to protect our cornfields or to protect um, some resource or power lines or, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, but some of these are actually in the name of conservation. So, for example, brown-headed cowbirds, um, over 30 years to protect Kirtland's warblers, um, over 125,000 cowbirds have been removed from the Kirtland warbler habitat to try and save them. Double-crested cormorants are being removed right now along the Columbia River um, to try and protect salmon stocks. Now, this is partially a conservation effort, but remember those salmon stocks are also part of commercial fishery. Um, so you might be able to argue that it's conservation or that it's um, commercial enterprises that they're trying to protect. But one of the questions that we have to wrestle with is, you know, are we willing to do those same kinds of management to create a healthy forest and to keep our health, our forests healthy. Um, oftentimes people people say to me, or when I, when I have these conversations with people, people feel really uncomfortable. They're like, you know, these are natural processes and we shouldn't be playing God. It's wrong for us to be playing God. My answer to them is that we have been playing God for centuries but we're actually terrible gods. We're mostly hapless, feckless gods who are knocking over the furniture and breaking the fine china without really even knowing what we're doing. And I think it's, it's time for us to really admit that we're top predators um, and that we're top ecosystem engineers and that we're even able to manipulate and change the climate on our planet. And there's good evidence that suggests that we can and do do that. But for some reason, we're having a hard time wrapping our minds around it. And I think that if we're going to have a healthy environment, if we're going to have an earth that we can live on, I think we have to embrace our role um, as gods, if you will, on this planet and be willing to manage the planet well. And so my challenge to all of you, and I think that this research project has been a challenge to me to wrap my mind around that myself, is that we need to begin thinking about the responsibility we have as humans um, and as occupants of this planet to take care of it. In the same way that we're willing to protect our cornfields and our highways and our power lines and be willing to kill birds to protect those, I think we also have to be, to at least wrap our minds around what it means um, to be the stewards of our natural environments too. And what, it, what, what does forced health look like and how do we protect forced health and how do we maintain forced health and how do we undo some of the damage that we've done? So 
I think this is going to be an important debate that we're going to all have. Uh, and I encourage you all to get involved in these debates. Um, but make sure that you really, truly inform yourself about, you know, about what is going on and that you do uh, embrace the role that we have as humans on this earth. The last thing that I would say is get out and see these spotted owls because they're so beautiful and they're so amazing. And, you know, I just don't know if they're going to be around much longer. And I think that's true for a lot of our endangered species. So get out and celebrate these things and go have a look at them. Um, and you know, do all that you can to enjoy the environment that we have. So thanks very much for joining me and learning a little bit about the work that we're doing on owls at the Academy. And, um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, I will jump right into questions because we have quite a few. Sharon asked, what is the actual process for counting how many birds are present in an area? Um, so, so the owl biologists have really worked this out to, um, to a science, if you will. Um, and what they typically do, well, they, they'll go out with those little speakers, those callers, and they'll, and they'll play calls and then they'll listen to responses. And owls are very territorial, so it's not that hard. If you hoot in the forest, they'll hoot back to you. And because spotted owls are endangered, you're not allowed to do this unless you have a permit because that really hassles birds and it, it gets them, um, it gets their, you know, their feathers up. And so, um, so you don't want to do that, but they'll go out and, and typically to do a spotted owl survey, they go back three times during the season, usually once early in the season, once mid season and once late season, they'll do those calls. They'll, they'll listen for responses. If they get a response, then they'll hike in during the day and see if they can find the so-called activity center where they have a nest. Um, there's other tricks that they use, um, something that they call mousing. So the, uh, the northern spotted owls are, are so tame that, that biologists will go out and they'll put a, a mouse on the ground. And they'll usually use a, a white mouse. It's really easy to see. And the owls will come right down and, and grab them. And if the owl is, is, um, has babies, it'll often fly off to feed the mouse to the babies. So um, then they can follow the owl into the nest. And so those are some of the tricks that the owl biologists use to find the nests and to, and to survey the number of owls on the habitat. This is all changing though today. And we're starting to use these things called ARUs or automated recording units. And so much of the owl habitat is broken up into 400 hectare hexagons. And they, they put these recording units on those hexagons and they move them usually three times a year um, to different places. And then they bring the recordings back, upload them to the computer, and then they have computer algorithms that find the calls wow. and count the number of call, calls in each one of the hexagons in order to keep track of how many owls there are and how healthy they are. Oh, so wow. that's that's generally how they um, how they survey, and they can use they use the same types of surveys for both uh, spotted and barred owls. Okay, well, um, and Zoe asks, this is related. Is there a standard for how many breeding pairs a, bear, a bird population needs to remain viable? That's a really interesting question, and no, we don't really know. But as the populations are are declining, what we find is that they tend to decline faster and faster. Mm -hmm. So a lot of endangered species biologists and um, th there's uh, there are folks who've designed a computer program called Vortex, and you can actually put in all the data that you have about a species, about you know its its, its normal rate of increase and how many how many offspring they have per year and how often they breed and and all this information, and then you can kind of figure out like how big a population has to be before it just begins to spiral down. Uh -huh. So, yeah. so there is some point at which it tips in the other direction and it can no longer maintain itself and then needs help from the outside. Um, whether we're at that point right now, we don't really know because there's a lot of other factors affecting them. Like um, we're still seeing big losses of habitat even though logging has really declined a lot. And, and even the logging industry has, has done a lot to try and preserve spotted owl habitat in recent years. They're actually, been important partners in the conservation work, I would say, in the last decade or two. Um, but we're still losing habitat to fire. And you know, fire has been a big topic yeah. here in California and all of the Western states because of the way forest has been managed. And, um, and, and so that continues to be a big issue. Uh, so we don't really have a good handle, I don't think, on, you know, what's a viable population size for northern spotted owls and whether we've already passed it or, you know, or where that threshold is. 
Right, right, okay. Um, and Ben was curious about whether you can get DNA from bird feathers or does it have to come from tissue? You can get DNA from bird feathers, um, but it's usually pretty degraded and it's, it's, and it's pretty hard to work with. Mm -hmm. So for, for doing these whole genome type analysis, um, it really helps to have the, you know, a specimen with a tissue sample. That said, really all it takes is blood. So all of the, the genome that we have for the Northern Spotted Owl was first assembled just from blood samples from an owl that's in captivity at Wild Care in San Rafael. Mm -hmm. And um, and we've been able to get enough data to to uh, we've done so much genetic sequencing on that one particular owl, and it's alive and doing well at Wild Care. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, you don't have to kill, and you know, even even though feathers isn't the best place to get DNA, um, owls to to get the the DNA. Great. Uh, so this one's from Sabine. I figured we'd get. <laughs> get one of these at least. Um, do you have any other favorite bird calls? I wanna hear some more. Oh, um, <laughs> I should have done the barred owl too because they have a similar hoot, uh -huh. um, but it's an eight note hoot. And in the, in the Eastern United States, we say that it says, who cooks for you, who cooks for you? And in the South, they kind of say, who cooks for you all? <laughs> and, um, and so it kind of goes like this, it goes. <laughs> and so that's, Growing up in the Eastern United States, barred owl was one of my favorite owls. And that call was like the sound of the forest at night in the summer. Yeah. And, um, and I love those owls. So that's another favorite. Um, but right now, birds from, you know, all over are coming back to their breeding grounds and they're all singing up a storm. Uh, so it, it's been amazing to be uh, stuck at home and get <laughs> to sit outside and work and listen to birds all morning long. So there, yeah. there are a ton of great birds out here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, from Rebecca, did these owls look the same 50,000 years ago as they do today? We think that they probably did. 50,000 years isn't that much time for evolution, which is one of the reasons why it's so shocking that the Western barred owls look so different from the Eastern barred owls, because, you know, 50,000 years is not that much time. Um, the We've done some estimates of the genetic divergence between spotted owls and barred owls, and we reckon that they're probably on the order of, um, you know, five to ten million years separated. So, you know, that that's quite a long time. And you know, and a lot of the genetic work that's been done suggests that, you know, the close species are usually at least two million years divergent before they become easily recognizable distinct species. And of, and of course, there's a lot of variation around that, but you know, when you, when you kind of keep that as your benchmark, it's 2 million years for sister species groups, uh, 50,000 years is nothing. It's right. a, it's a yeah. blink of the eye. Right. Okay, I'll ask three more. Um, let's see, from Victor, he says, you mentioned that we discovered that the diet of barred owl, is, barred owl sorry, is highly diverse with some of it being quite surprising. Do we know that the spotted owls wouldn't have a similarly diverse diet if we were to open them up? Yeah, well, that's a really important question because I think you know, so much of our, of our knowledge of owl's diet comes from pellet studies. Mm -hmm. And you know, most of these invertebrates, you know, things like, things like earthworms um, will never be preserved in a, in a pellet. And, and you need a lot of hair and feathers to actually even form a pellet. So, so you know, one of the things that all this work is suggesting is that you know, maybe we don't know as much or we should head a little bit more on what we think we know about spotted owls and western screech owls and all the other owls that you know we end up collecting pellets from and getting diet information um so so yeah that has opened up that and one of the things we've done is just look at the the comparison of of barred owl diets from pellets versus barred owl diets from um these stomach contents and our colleagues up north have now thousands you know thousands of these um comparisons that they've been able to do. And, and so now we're getting a handle on how different those those can be. But again, for northern spotted owls, we really don't know. And you know, we don't like to open up the stomach of northern spotted owls for obvious reasons. And so, you know, we we just will never have that kind of data. Mm -hmm. um, we do sometimes get owls um, when they when there's you know when there's a road kill or a window kill or you know, one is found dead, but they, they usually are sick and they don't have much in their stomach when we, when we get those. Right. So we right. don't, um, 
So that's, that's a great question and it really points out a, la uh, you know, a gap in our knowledge. Right. Okay. Uh, Eric asks, what skills or areas do you think a biology major who wants to be an ornithologist should be focusing on? I would say, you know, it's amazing because so many people come to me they're like, I love the outdoors. I love animals. I've always wanted to be a biologist. Can I, you know, what do I need to do? And I would tell, I would tell them um, that today, so much of the work involves big data, whether it's genetics or, you know, all the, all the kind of data that we have are just such big data sets. Um, the sound analysis that we do with the ARUs, the way that we survey birds, it's big data. And so learn to program in multiple languages, you know, you, you need to know, I'd say R and Python are really valuable. Um, so, so have a good math background because to make it science and all involves statistics and understanding, you know, the numbers and being able to do comparison, figure out what's really going on. So math, computer programming. And the last thing I would say is writing. Um, I, I recently saw a, a study that, that, that looked at different professions by how much time they spend writing and scientists were right up at the very top, you know, behind journalists, but right up there because we're constantly having to write papers. We're constantly having to write grant proposals. And so for better or for worse, um, if you love being outside and you love animals, becoming a professional biologist is a sure way to be stuck in front of a computer for much of your time and not get to spend as much time outside. So, um, so it's hard to walk that balance and to, you know, and to make sure that we do get to have time outside and be inspired by the animals that, you know, we study. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it, those other skills are going to be the things that distinguish you and in the end get you a job in the field. Great. Okay. Uh, so last question, and this, this maybe is, this is a big one. Maybe it's tough. Depeche, he asks, what's the biggest question facing ornithology today? You know, if you asked a hundred different ornithologists, you get a hundred different answers depending upon, you know, what different yeah. people think is important. But I would definitely say that anybody who studies natural populations, you know, natural populations, whatever they are um, of things, will, will say that, you know, conservation is a really critical issue. Um, you know, if you study evolution, um, you know, you realize that everything is beginning to evolve differently because of the habitats and everything is, is changing. And if you um, if you're interested in ecology, you realize ecology is changing. So so I would say that, you know, conservation and human impacts are, are all a threat to the things that we study. And if we want to keep studying, we've got to take care of them first. And then the world is our oyster and we can ask whatever questions we want. Right. But, you know, one of the first priorities is to just to make sure that you know, everything is healthy and thrives and that, you know, and that we do well. And humans can also continue to thrive, which requires healthy ecosystems and environments. Yeah, great. Okay, Jack, thank you so much. And you've said that you'll come back and give us another talk on the poisonous birds that you mentioned. I'd love to. Great. Love okay, to. we'll hold you to that. I was, I realized too that you mentioned like in your, in when we were talking in the beginning, you mentioned that a scratch had played like a really big role in altering your career choice from marine to terrestrial. And a scratch actually played a really big role in your discovery of the poisonous birds too, didn't it? That's right. In fact, we were studying mating systems of birds of paradise when I was taking a poisonous bird out of the net and no biologist realized that they were poisonous. And it was by getting bitten by a poisonous bird. Oh. And then, you know, it, it really stung and you go, ow. Oh, and then your mouth begins to tingle and burn and go numb. and and then we asked the local folks, we said, what do you guys know about these birds? And they said, oh, that's a, that's a rubbish bird. You shouldn't touch them. They're poisonous. And we said, well, gosh, no one has ever heard of a poisonous bird in our side of the world. So we started studying them. And, and so I'd love to come back and talk about that in another talk. Okay, we'll plan it. We'd love to have you. Um, awesome. Yeah. And for folks watching, thank you so much for tuning in. Come back uh, Tuesday, May 5th at 10 a.m., and we'll have our dive safety officer, Merodius Bell, on, and he oversees. He's someone who, unlike Jack, was like, I love that gear. Give me more gear. <laughs> he oversees <laughs> all of the diving programs for us um, from the aquarium to our scientific diving of, for deep reef exploration. So it should be really interesting. Um, Jack, thank you again. Viewers, thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you, Laurel. Thanks, everybody, for Bye. tuning in. Have a great day. See ya.